This session is simple words to understand physics and chemistry. And we're showing the levels of the Ethernet acceleration physics stack. That is an E with a triple dot on top and an A with a double dot on top by dot accents. Now, in math, we've learned some basic levels. We've learned position, velocity, and acceleration. And there's some math underlying that. It's taught in basic algebra, and we know about these three levels. So you have an x to the zero exponent, but typically that's called the p or the position. And I call that the math exponent level zero. x to the one is the velocity. And usually it's called V or uh, X prime or something like that. And what you're really doing is looking at the, the differential of that equation. And then there's the acceleration. Now, the units of this is distance for position, distance over time, and then this is the change of that. So that's distance over time change over time, so distant over time squared, okay? Which again gets you to the different levels. The math exponent level typically in physics is the level of differentials in time. Not changing in time, changing one level of time, or changing a level over time again, a second time. Now, in, we can have all sorts of varieties of these. For example, in physics, we can have a braking a car. So that can have positive velocity, but negative acceleration. So these levels are independent or related by equations. And that's all of what physics is about, is trying to relate how these different things relate because that's the real world. That's the physical world that we live in. These are especially true in Newton's laws of motion. Let's read them. In Newton's laws of motion, the first law of motion says an object at rest will stay at rest. Well, that's position. The, there's no movement. There's no change in time. It's going to stay there for all of time. But Newton said something additional. He said an object in motion will continue in motion in a straight line unless, and that is velocity. So that's position changing in time. And Newton said that the normal state is that once you start a position in time, it doesn't change, which gets you to the third one, unless acted upon by another force. Now, there's that word force, but I'm telling you in math, that is acceleration, okay? It is the change of the velocity over time. No change in time, at rest, okay? Continuous in time, uh, distances changing the same in time, or the distance in time itself is changing. Then you get to Newton's second law. And that says that acceleration equals force divided by mass. Now, what in the world is that? Uh, effectively, that's what causes us confusion when we try and apply this to physics. To me, Mass is some sort of a field. It's, it's the physics core of something in the mass stack. So let's go look at that. You see, I think what we're doing in current fixes needs to be re-understood. Now, obviously there's challenges because physics had 26 letters and then it had Greek, and so we're using them. However, there's no consistent marking for what about these stack levels. Because if you do an equation and you're doing one uh, uh, level or the other, um, you can see that, that you're at different exponents. And I'm gonna show you that. Now, that, in the physics world, to me, you start with the ether, okay? And that's the, effectively also called the fields. And those fields drive the accelerations, okay, or the forces, which become velocities, which become positions. And I'm using a different name for this 
because the equations are slightly different and they're separated for these four in a way that these are not. Now, as you can see, in physics also, the exponents go downward. It's d to the minus one, d to the minus two, d to the minus three, which is one over distance, one over distance squared, one over distance cubed. But again, these still follow the basic level of math level zero, one, two, and now three. So what is, should, why do we need to have consistent markings? Well, that's because I apply different forces. You see, Bohr taught there's an extra one over R offsetting balance that creates the electron shell. Now he described it as an orbit, and of course that's wrong. Electrons are not moving. They have um, fairly stable positions. Uh, usually in longitudinal rings in two hemispheres, okay? Now, but that means that we have, I'm going to go with a force acceleration level, one over distance squared. That's electrostatic force. That's the one we all know about. It's done by Coulomb's law, which has a Coulomb's constant of K. And so the force equals K, the charge Q1 times Q2 over distance squared. But there's an offsetting one, which is a negative, the opposite direction, one over distance cubed. And to me, that's a static force. And that also comes from the strong nuclear force. That's why I call it the nucleostatic. It is not orbital, but static, but it has that extra one over R. So the problem is, we used to think, oh, well, I know what level I'm at. If it's a, if it's a one over R, it must be at the potential level. It's R squared. I must be at the force level and it's one over R cubed. I must be at the uh, field level, okay? But the problem is that I've got one over R square cube, uh, cubed here, but I also have a one over R cubed here. So I don't know if the equation is a nucleostatic acceleration or whether it's a field of electrostatic. And you'll see in advanced physics that we keep getting different ratios. In fact, we get these ratios, then when you're trying to do interfaces to them, you get these conversions. So this becomes the three over the two, comes up here, and you get the uh, equilibrium versus edge scaling factor, also known as the fine structure constant. And you'll see it's applied at three halves or one half, or even worse, when you get into localization, you'll find four thirds. Or in my paper on mass, you'll get an exponent of three quarters. Well, three quarters is just us trying to deal with fields that are a different level so that we can uh, apply them. And so I believe that we need to be able to show which level we're at. As an example of those three quarters, let me just show you, here's well, my proof of uh, the mass of a proton versus the mass of the electron. You see, you take that scaling of the Bohr radius, the equilibrium, versus the edge, the radius of an electron, and it has a, a scale of 18,778. Okay, squared is uh, 352 million. And that's the ratio of what charge is per particle. And as you'll see in my paper, we don't use Coulombs anymore. There's no charge. It's really just Planck's constant. But to do that conversion, you also end up with this extra one half factor, which becomes 135. And that's the fine structure constant that you'll find throughout the advanced um, subatomic physics. Now, what they haven't done, and what my paper does, is shows that then you go to the three and the four, so you get the one third. Well, that obviously you're already in the right place. We don't use that very much, but from the three to the four, you're at the ether level. So you get this one quarter. And that one quarter, this A over E to the one quarter is 16,778. But, and that's what applies for hydrogen. If you then have in stable molecules, you have the cubed, two cubed minus one cubed is eight over seven. Sorry, eight, uh, two cubed times two cubed minus one cubed. 
because that electron is at the far side, so it's twice as far away by this nucleostatic force. So you, the electron ends up setting this extra main. Then you have to use the anomalous moment, which is this very tiny factor found by Schwinger and Feynman and Tomonaga. <clears throat> and you get to 1836.1, which is the ratio of the proton mass to the electron size. It's based upon its position within a field. <clears throat> now, today's physics stack goes through lots of steps, and it's very difficult to understand, and you need a university or graduate degree to, uh, to even talk about it, and lots and lots of math. So you have that basic position, velocity acceleration, but using Newton's second, you convert that mass and by this factor of mass to force. And then that force also has fields and potentials as it's up and down. And then de Broglie had a transition which then divided that H, which is that Planck's constant, okay, by the way, I'm just getting a wave function. And then Born did that to get the probability and those are those big fuzzy balls you'll see out there in longitudinal rings to describe electron shells and where the electrons are. And then you'll go up to localization, which is another one of those four thirds exponents that we use in distribution function theory to again figure out computational chemistry. And to then again, the today's physics path has another thing that they still haven't figured out how to fit into this process called gravity. Now, that's very complex and most people can't get to this easily, but it can be simplified. You see, there are three fundamental forces and they are either radial or axial. Okay, there's the radial electrostatic, that's the like kind repel, opposites attract, that we find and know about. Okay, the other one is this extra one over R, radial nucleostatic. So in this graph, we have the, from the electron to the proton, opposites. So the electrostatic attracts, but the strong nuclear force is always opposite in direction and it's extra one over R. So you have two curves and they must always find a point of balance. That's the Bohr hydrogen, the Bohr H radius of equilibrium. So Planck's constant, they talk about, but they don't use the word Planck at Bohr H or Planck at equilibrium. It's a strength, but it's already decreased for that balancing position. Now, the other thing about this is when you create a charge or a nucleostatic energy, you're also creating an axis. Everything has an axis. The periodic table is two times the squares. You can see that in one of my other videos. And that's because there is a force towards the axis, okay? It's as if it's really towards every point in the office, but obviously if you've got right and left, it ends up balancing, going straight towards the axis. Now that's, as a result, you have three forces, and that starts to get you what is this cylinder surface. And then gravity is derivative of those in that, because that's that one minus that. And so gravity is just the net of the proton electrostatic minus the electron electrostatic but it's a little bit closer in this big shell. So you take out four thirds pi r squared of that um, uh, Bose two cylinder. Okay, so now when you do that, you don't have that long list of calculations. You see here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight transitions. And for me, you have the normal one, two, and then you have the same transition applied to the three known forces. So it's one, two, three, four, five. I've just cut out 40% of the calculations if you use this method. So what do you have? You have the standard stack, position, velocity, acceleration. And acceleration, instead of being 
force over mass, it is, I'm going to call it the atomic thrust divided by the atomic drag. Now, thrust is somewhat like force, but you've segmented these three so you don't get the, the problems that you have in mass. And when you segment these three, I understand why mass is variable and all those things that we have problems with. And the atomic drag is really comes from the, the next derivative of the ether. And that's the fields in the current sense. And that's all the different forces that have been pumped out as they spread over the universe can either, can, can either do that or they actually will slow down because you've got to push those fields with your thrust. So your acceleration has to be reduced. So as a result, I want to show these things. And so whenever you'll see in my papers, I'm going to write my levels using dot accents so that you know what level I'm working at. Most of it will be up at the acceleration level. So now you can go from position, velocity, acceleration, and the ether. Okay, one dot for velocity, two dots, and three dots. It's all very simple.